Praise the Lord. This is Elder Henry Reinhardt, and I want to come to you today and talk to you about the institution of marriage in Christ. And I want to talk about imparting some words of knowledge, understanding, and instruction for married couples in the body of Christ. These are things that aren't discussed nearly enough with the children of God, generally speaking. So I want to spend a little time this evening talking about this issue. There's a question that I want to present to you as I start out this teaching. And the question is, is marriage carnal or spiritual? That's the question. Is marriage carnal or spiritual? The answer to that question is this. Marriage is, in fact, carnal. So what does that mean? To say that marriage is carnal means that it is primarily related to physical, especially sexual, needs and activities between a husband and a wife. Marriage is not spiritual, but it is simply human temporal, worldly, and secular in its nature. Your husband or your wife in this physical life will not be your husband or your wife in heaven should you both make it to that glorious place. There is no such thing as marriage in heaven between a man and a woman. Nevertheless, marriages in the Lord are to be Christ-centered, even though they're not spiritual. That means that they should ideally be between two saved people, two people who are in Christ. And these two people should be worshiping the Lord, both of them, in spirit and in truth, ideally, and serving him and praying before him as a couple. The husband, as the head of the wife, should be seeking God for guidance on what decisions are to be made and how to properly love his wife and his family. Now, I just said that ideally, marriage should be between two saved people. That way you will not be unequally yoked together. For in the mind of God, it is the will of God that married couples in Christ would not be unequally yoked. In other words, that one of them would not be saved and the other unsaved. However, let me, let me take a moment to deal with this issue because this is very important. Oftentimes, when people are first born again into the body of Christ, either a husband or a wife may be unsaved. Amen. Oftentimes, you will have a situation in which two people, a husband and wife, in the world, outside of Christ, before either of them, is saved. Sometimes 
the husband and wife will get saved together, but that's, that's a rarity. Most of the time, that's not the way it happens. Most of the time, in most cases, one of the people will get saved first, and the other will not be saved. So, in the case where there is an unsaved husband that is left once the wife becomes saved and, and is in the body of Christ, you it, a situation develops where they are not equally yoked together. In other words, one of them is saved and will be in Christ and will be pursuing the things of the Lord and will have a love for the Lord. The other individual will still be in the world, will love the things of the world, will want to do the things of the world. However, in such a situation, amen, the scriptures let us know that that wife, that wife that has been saved, she still is to humble herself and to be submissive to her husband. Now, she is not required of God to do evil that her husband may want her to do or to participate in the things of the world that her husband may still want her to do. In other words, if they both were people who went out night clubbing and got drunk together and all these kinds of things before she got saved, God does not require her to humble herself and to submit to him from the standpoint if he tries to make her, tell her she has to go out to the club with him or she has to, you know, go drinking with him. He, she does not have to do that. Glory to God, God is not going to look down upon her unfavorably if she explains to him that she does not want to do that anymore because she is in the church now, because she is saved. She has to use wisdom if that type of situation developed. And the scripture says, a soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. A woman in that situation, should behave herself humbly, very humbly toward her husband. She should speak softly. She should try to reason with him. And usually, when the woman can have that kind of approach, the situation can be dealt with in a very peaceful manner which will not result in, in altercations and things because of that situation. But it, it, it creates a situation in which these kinds of things have to be dealt with delicately. And there's also the issues uh, involving the marriage itself, especially sexually speaking, that may be impacted by this change, but in either case, whether or not the, the wife is saved first, or whether or not the husband is saved first, we all need to understand that when that happens, then they will be unequally yoked together. One will be spiritual and one will be natural. One will be trying to follow God, Lord, and to do the things of God, and one will still be in the world and doing the things of the world. It is incumbent upon the one who is newly saved, therefore, to really be seeking God and really be living for the Lord and doing the things of God and being an example. Even though they're a babe in Christ, they must be an example of holiness and godliness and righteousness, and hopefully through their example and through their godly living, they can be an instrument to lead the other person on into Christ that they might be saved. And I have seen examples over the years where, amen, this happened. When if the, new, if the newly born again children of God are obedient to the Lord, and if they're living for God, 
because of that love that that husband and wife have, even though they're, one is in the world and one is in the church, if that saved person will live according to the word of God and will be a good example, I've seen examples of where they were able to draw that other person into Christ because they wanted to be with them, and it ended up with both of them being saved. Amen. I can think back, and there are several examples of, of, of people of God that I had known over the years in which that thing actually happened. One of them was saved, and the other one was soon saved after that one because they wanted to be with their husband or to be with their wife. I wanted to spend just a few minutes dealing with that before I moved on. So, when the Apostle Paul discussed the institution of marriage with the Corinthian church in, in the epistle of 1 Corinthians, he stated that, this is what he stated, he stated it is good for a man not to touch a woman. And this is stated in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 1. But, he said, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. And this is written in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 2. We must read this passage of Scripture with the proper interpretation, however, of what was said in verses 1 and 2. First, we must understand that Paul was a eunuch by choice who dedicated himself completely unto the service of the Lord. He was not a married man in Christ. He chose to remain a single man throughout his saved life. By doing this, Paul was able to avoid many of the fleshly issues involved with loving a woman and having <clears throat> and pleasing a wife. Paul, in that same chapter, later explains that what he had said in verse 1 was by permission and not of commandment. In other words, Paul was simply sharing his personal view on the subject of whether a man should be married or not and whether he should remain single or not. And it is certainly not the commandment of God that one has to be celibate. So, you know, to go back, when Paul said, when Paul said it is good for a man not to touch a woman, Paul was not speaking by commandment. God never said any such thing. As a matter of fact, in, in you know, early on in creation, God is the one who said it is not good that the man should be alone. So he made a helpmeet. He made a woman for Adam and brought the woman to Adam. And they too, amen, this is the first marriage, and they too became one flesh, the scripture says. So it was not by commandment that Paul made that statement. Paul was simply expressing what he did by permission. It was his personal view because Paul had chosen to be a eunuch. So that's all Paul was saying at that point when he said that, that as far as he was concerned, that he felt it was best that the man would be alone. So we might ask ourselves a question, what did the Lord Jesus himself teach concerning a man remaining celibate? remaining unmarried. 
in the Gospel of Matthew, this is what the Lord Jesus had to say. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 12, the Lord said, For there are some eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb, and there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men, and there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. Now, not all men or women can receive this saying that Jesus said, and he explained that. For most are not able to forego the necessity of a woman or a man. It is God's will, generally speaking, that men and women marry, be fruitful, and multiply in the earth. However, when we do get married in the church, there is a crucial fact we need to understand. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says concerning a married man and a married woman in the Lord. But I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he that is married careth for the things that are of the world how he may please his wife. There is difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman care for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she that is married care for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. And this comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 32. <coughs> through 34. With these three verses, Paul is letting us know the truth about the carnal nature of marriage, even in the Lord. A husband will care for the things of the world and how he may please his wife, and a wife will care for the things of the world and how she may please her husband, even in Christ. These are facts about the marriage relationship. And God is not displeased because of this. That's very important. God is not, these, these are simply facts. Paul was teaching the church and letting them know these facts. But God is not displeased because of these facts. Remember, as I said, God was the one who instituted the very first marriage. God is the one who made the woman for the man and brought her to Adam that she might become his wife. So God is not displeased because of these facts that I just discussed. But if one is married, it does prevent us from attending upon the Lord without distraction. For example, when, when we're married, we are not to fast without first obtaining the permission of our spouse as to when and how long the fast is to be. As it is written, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5, listen to what it says. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. To love that woman you are married to is to want her, to care for her, to provide for her, to protect her, to cherish her, 
and to be sexually faithful to only her. Sisters, to love your husband is to submit to him in obedience, to give your body to him and only him, to be willing to bear his children and to nurture and raise them in the fear of the Lord, to be chaste, to be a keeper and guider of the home, and to conduct yourself in a manner that will not bring shame upon yourself or upon your husband. These things should not prevent us from loving the Lord as we need to, but we need to understand that when we are married in Christ, God expects and requires that we love our spouses as well as love Him. As a matter of fact, to love our spouse is to obey God and thus complying with that commandment to love them is a significant part of our love to the Lord. God is to take priority and, and preeminence in our lives in terms of our love for Him, but God commands that as married people, the husband love his wife and the wife love her husband and submit unto her husband. That's a, that's a requirement. Those are commandments. And so we must do that in order to be in good standing with the Lord. If these things were not important to the Lord, then they would not be written. So I advise all of the children of God who are married to give heed to these things. They are written, and because they are written, it's obvious that they're very important and necessary, amen, to the Lord. God bless you.